And if you've been joining us in the summer, you know we've been working through our summer sermon series going through the book of Acts. And we've been looking at how the first followers of Jesus had to rethink their faith. They had to rethink what they thought about God, the scriptures, many of their assumptions based on the surprise ending of Jesus. And it's not that Jesus was the Messiah that was so surprising. It was that this Messiah, the Savior of the world, would allow himself to be crucified on a cross. And then that he would rise from the dead. Not many Jews believed in resurrection, but those that did believed that there would be a general resurrection at the end of the age, not one person rising from the dead. So they really didn't know what to do with all this information. So they're trying to figure it out and rethink their faith. Now, there is tension brewing under the surface in the book of Acts. There is controversy bubbling up. It's not bubbling over yet. You wouldn't know it unless you've already read chapter 11 and onward. But you wouldn't know that there was trouble brewing, but there is. As people spread out throughout the known world, as they shared the good news with different kinds of people, uh, first the, some of the disciples went and preached to the Samaritans, people that Jews did not associate with for centuries. Uh, you have Phil speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch, and now we have Peter in a much more high-profile case where people are receiving the good news of Jesus and responding even though they're not Jewish and they're not being required to follow the requirements of Jewish law. So, this story has some similarities to last week's story. We talked about the conversion of Saul last week. And in that story, God was talking to two people at once. He was talking to Saul, and he was sending him to Samaria. And he was talking to Ananias and saying, go over to Saul's house. Well, this story is similar, and we're introduced to a person named Cornelius. And he is a Roman centurion. So he's a Roman citizen who is in charge of 100 Roman soldiers. So he has a lot of rank in the Roman army. But it also says he's God-fearing. That he is, he's not Jewish, but he's interested in the Jewish God. And so he prays, he's seeking God in his life. And it's during one of those times of prayer that he has this vision where God tells him to send some people to get Peter, the apostle, bring him to his house to have him say what he needs to say, whatever it is. So he does that. He, he sends servants out to Joppa, where Peter is. Meanwhile, Peter is praying on his roof, which sounds kind of strange. But back then, in those days, pe people oftentimes had rooms set up on the roof of their house. It was a great way to stay cool. And so he was on the roof praying when he has a vision of God. And this is a really strange vision because there's this blanket. And it lets out, shows all these animals, some clean and some unclean. And this doesn't mean some of them need a bath. It means that, that according to their Jewish law, certain animals were okay to eat and they were considered clean. This is a religious category. We're not talking about germs or uh, hygiene here. We're talking about religious categories. So certain animals were cons considered clean and okay to eat. Certain animals were considered unclean. And it's very particular if you read in the Old Testament. It even sometimes has to do with the hooves of the animal for, in certain cases. So it's very particular. So he sees this, all these different kinds of animals. Some are unclean. And God says, kill and eat. Peter emphatically says, no way. I'm not going to do that. He's probably thinking that this is a test of his faith. And there's no way he's going to fail this test. He's already failed once before, denying knowing Jesus three times. There's no way he's going to do that again. And so he says, no way, Lord, would I kill and eat these animals. Well, it happens again, and it happens a third time, which means it's really important. Meanwhile, Peter's just not quite sure what this vision is about. But that's when the servants come to his house from Cornelius, and uh, God calls him to follow these servants. So he goes with them, and he, he goes to Cornelius' house where he has some close friends and relatives gathered. And then there are even more people gathered around the house outside. And so Peter comes, and he says, well, what am I here for, basically? And Cornelius says, well, I just felt called by God to sin for you, and uh, uh, so now we're supposed to listen to what you have to say. Folks, that is an awesome setup for a preacher. It really is. And so 
Peter is uh, ready to preach, and he some things are clicking in his head. His wheels are turning, and he starts to see the meaning of the vision that he had from God, because it's connected to this experience that he's having. And so he, he comes to some very profound realizations. Number one, he says I, that he's learning that he should never call a person impure. He's saying that Jews and Gentiles are forbidden to associate with one another, but I am learning that I should never call a person impure. Secondly, a little later on, he says that God does not show partiality between one group of people over another. So we'll come back to those thoughts in a moment, but to finish out the story, he preaches the gospel. Interestingly enough, the gospel is not a bunch of theology. He's not trying to explain the cross or how Jesus' death on the cross results in forgiveness of sins. He doesn't try to go into all of that. He just says, Jesus came. We have all been witnesses to the fact that he healed people. He cast out spirits. He taught. And then people killed him. They crucified him. And then God vindicated him by rise, raising him up from the dead. And there is forgiveness in his name. Okay, that's the gospel. The gospel message is not a bunch of theology. The gospel message is the story of Jesus. Period. So he tells the gospel story. And then, wouldn't you know it, the Holy Spirit comes again. The Holy Spirit kind of photobombs. It's like the Holy Spirit photobombs all these moments, you know. The Holy Spirit just breaks into the moment and just comes upon these people. And uh, they, they start showing signs that they have the Holy Spirit. And some people that came along with Peter, some Jew, Jews, they're, they're just perplexed. Like, what? The Holy Spirit came? Evidently, they didn't get the memo that the Holy Spirit is not really cooperating with the, a lot of their religious categories anymore. And so the Holy Spirit comes on these people, and so they baptize them. This is similar, in a way, to the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. But it's much more of a high-profile case, like I said. It's much more public. And it, so all these people are baptized, and they are welcomed into the fellowship of, of, the, of Christians. There wasn't a word for Christian yet. It was followers of Christ. They were still Jewish. There was not a separate religion. And that was part of the problem, is that people were not being required to change their religion in order to follow Jesus. They did not have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. They didn't have to follow the Jewish law, the, the holidays, the holy days, the, the diets, and all those things. Uh, they were not required to change their religion. There was no Christian religion, and they weren't required to be Jewish. So this was a big controversy, but you don't see it yet. You'll see it in the next chapter, two weeks from today, when we continue this series. We'll get into that. This is a big deal. And the two statements, those two thoughts that Peter came up with, are huge. They're profound. More profound than we realize. Because, you see, up until this point, the Jewish faith had primarily been a nationalistic religion. It had been a religion about the nation of Israel. Now, true, there you can read in the Old Testament about how the Israelites had been blessed so that they could be a blessing to others. They were a chosen people, not because they were better than anyone else, but they were simply chosen by God to be instruments that he would use to bless the world. But it didn't mean that God doesn't work, wasn't working in other people or that God wasn't working in other nations. But that started to be the viewpoint of many of the people of, of that time is that they were chosen because they were special. They were somehow better than others. And therefore, their religion was primarily about Israel and what was going to happen to Israel and Basically, the prophecies are that Israel is going to be on top and everybody else is going to learn from them. And uh, so it's very, very centered on their nation. It was not a worldwide religion by any means. And by and large, people did not have a huge desire for that to happen. Uh, people could convert to Judaism if they wanted, but it was not an easy process. And uh, generally, it was considered to be more about the nation. But now what Peter is doing with these two thoughts, God has shown me that I should not call any person impure, and also God does not show partiality to one group of people over another, is he is laying the seed for what will become a worldwide religion. And of course I know Judaism and Christianity are both worldwide religions. And Judaism is not all what I am explaining to you and describing to you of what it was like in those days for some Jews. Okay? We don't want to stereotype and say, this is how all Jews are. 
because that's not true. The Jewish faith, like Christianity, is multifaceted, and you will find all different kinds of viewpoints and persuasions within the Jewish faith, as well as the Christian faith. But in those days, for most of the people that are mentioned in the New Testament time, they were thinking more on a limited scope, and Peter and others are starting to see that the world, as it is redefined by Jesus, is so much different than what they ever thought. You know, I have to wonder if Peter was stressed about all of this. You know, he's having to think about all these new ideas. Here he is preaching things that are completely different than what he grew up believing. He's having to preach basically against some of the foundational core beliefs of the Jewish faith, circumcision, dietary laws, uh, things like that nature that are foundational to identify them as a Jewish people. And he and Paul and others are saying, man, it's okay if you want to do that. And actually, they're saying you shouldn't do that anymore. They're saying that, that this is no longer necessary. That'd be stressful, wouldn't it? No doubt Peter probably knew people that he grew up with who probably disagreed with him on this. And, uh, you know, here he is. They're, they're probably going to talk to him. In fact, we know that because we'll find out in the next chapter that there, there's a specially called church conference to talk about Peter and what he had done. And so, you know, you know this is a big deal. And there were people that disagreed with him that he knew. You know, and I wonder if they're like, Peter's going off the rails. Peter's going off the rails, you know, it's a slippery slope. And so it would have been very stressful for Peter, I'm sure. And yet this is a huge deal. This became the debate of the century. You see it everywhere in the New Testament. Everywhere In the letters of Paul, Paul is constantly writing about this, how the Jewish law is to be followed now that Jesus has come. And uh, Paul would write that, you know, the Jewish law, didn't, you didn't need to be circumcised, you didn't need to worry about what you eat or what days you celebrate. And meanwhile, then these other people, you know what Paul called them? False teachers. False teachers. All these false teachers are coming and saying you need to be circumcised. All these false teachers are coming and saying that you need to follow the law. And he's very, he loses his temper sometimes in his letters. You know? And, and he, he, he gets very passionate because that's how Paul is. But he talks about these false teachers and he almost demonizes them in a way. But we have to realize the false teachers, they're not these demonic creatures. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think, of, ooh, false teacher. You know, gotta stay away from them. You know, and and really, what what Paul is referring to is those that disagree with him. What he is referring to are the people who believe that they should follow the traditional faith that has been handed down to them for generations. He's referring to the people who believe that this Jewish law should be followed, that it should, that these parts should not be thrown out just willy-nilly because of some person, some experience that they had with a person named Jesus. That they're saying that they shouldn't just throw away these laws that men and women gave their lives for. They shouldn't just throw out this faith that, that Moses had received these laws on Mount Sinai from God. You can't just give up on the, these laws. So they're not so demonic, they just disagree. And what we have in the Bible is we mainly have the writings of, of the more, uh, I guess you would call the more progressive group, who said, uh, well, really, there are parts of our faith that are really kind of antiquated and not really fit now that the world is kind of redefined by Jesus Christ. And some of these things just don't fit anymore, and we need to be able to adapt, and we need to be able to move. And, and we have those writings because they became scripture. Right? Because that view went out. So we don't have the writings in Scripture of those that disagreed with Paul and Peter and said, now wait a minute. And there were very prominent church leaders who disagreed with them, including James at one point, the brother of Jesus. So, so this was a very real debate, and there were people on both sides who had valid arguments for what they believed. And you know what, by the way, I think it's okay that we, we have the right to Paul and the New Testament rather than the other side, because I tend to agree with them. You know, I tend to believe that, uh, you know, that those things are necessary. And so 
these two statements that God does not show partiality towards one group of people over another and that we should never call a person impure changed the course of history. It is what led Christianity to becoming a worldwide religion. If it was not for these realizations, we would not be Christian. We would never have heard of Christianity because it would have remained a sect within the Jewish faith and it eventually probably would have fizzled out. So we have Peter and Paul and other pioneers of the faith and, and for asking questions and, and seeking answers that are not always easy. We have them to thank for that. You know, as we think about this, they were trying to figure out how to live and be faithful to God in this new reality of Jesus Christ. And we continue to work out those implications today. You know, sometimes we think, we think, well, uh, what is the church coming to? You know, isn't it kind of funny that we had a specially called church conference of our own last February? And uh, we're going to have another conference in uh, May of 2020. And, and we think, you know, what is the world coming to? What is the church coming to? You know, we're having these conferences and we're doing all these things and it doesn't seem very spiritual and, and all these things. It seems more political and all this. And then we realize, oh, well, I guess it's really not that new after all. I guess this stuff has been going on throughout history. Churches have been meeting and convening for conferences to try to figure things out for centuries. You know, they did it in the first century with uh, Peter and dealing with him. They uh, have done it throughout history. They, uh, it was conferences and things that created the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. It's the conferences and things like that 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 help make Christianity what it is. And sometimes it might not always seem very spiritual, and yet somehow the Holy Spirit is still working and moving uh, in these groups. And so as we live in our current age, as we in the 21st century try to seek to learn what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be faithful in a world that is being redefined through Jesus Christ even 2,000 years later, and what that means in our context, we don't have all the answers, and, and we don't all agree, just as the church in the first century didn't all agree on their issue. But I think that wherever we're at, I think that if we can live according to these profound thoughts and realizations that Peter had, that God has shown him that he should not call any person impure, and that God does not show favoritism towards one group of people over another. I think that we're going to be going on the right track.